Hello beautiful friends and bookish fam. My name is Brittany. Welcome back or welcome to Rescues and Reads. It is that time of the year. It is time for the mid-year book freakout tag. I'm sure that I don't really need to explain to you what this tag is. It is probably one of the most popular tags on booktube. Every single booktuber does it every single year. It's just kind of like a check-in point for our reading so far. I quite honestly have not really done any preparation for this tag whatsoever, so we're gonna see how it goes. So let's just jump into the tag question. Okay, question number one is the best book that I've read so far in 2023. Now, I've only rated four books five stars in the year of 2023 so far, and since I know that a couple of them are actually going to end up being answers to questions a little bit further on in the tag. I'm only going to talk about one of them here for right now, but please know that all of the books that I've rated five stars, I consider my favorites for the year. But the one that I do want to talk to you about is Part of Your World by Abby Jimenez. I had heard nothing but praise for this book from anybody who had read it that I had watched on booktube. And so naturally when I went into it, I went into it with caution because I like very specific things in my romances. And if even one of them is just missed, it can automatically be taken from a five to a four pretty, pretty quickly. So you can imagine my surprise when this book literally hit every single one one of my romance buttons. So this follows the romance between our two main characters, Alexis Montgomery and Daniel Grant. And Alexis is driving home from a funeral one day. They're living in Minnesota. She's driving through a very rural part of town. And all of a sudden, I believe if I remember correctly, she swerves to avoid hitting an animal and her car winds up in a ditch. And she's on the phone with her best friend. And then suddenly somebody pulls up behind her and offers to tow her out. And it is Daniel. And he tows her out of the ditch and she has to pee. She's very, very hungry. The biggest town is like 40 minutes away and she knows that she's not gonna make it. So so she ends up stopping at this little hole in the wall, one of the only things that's open. And there she actually runs into Daniel Grant again. They end up connecting and she does something that's very out of character for her. She has a one night stand with him. Now Daniel is from this very, very small town in Minnesota. He's kind of like their honorary mayor. He knows absolutely everybody in there. He helps run this bed and breakfast that I believe has been in his family for a while, but it's just him. And he's just this very wholesome, hardworking, blue collar, sweet man. And so you're following the development between Alexis and Daniel as their relationship grows into something neither one of them ever expected. But it's very complicated for Alexis because Alexis is an ER surgeon. She and her family have a very long history, a long standing history at this one hospital where there's always been a Montgomery in residence there ever since the hospital opened. Because her brother has decided to take a different path, it is up to Alexis to continue this legacy. So she's feeling a lot of pressure on her shoulders. Not to mention she has currently just gotten out of a very toxic relationship with another head doctor at the hospital. So the hospital is not really a place that she wants to be. She doesn't want to carry on this legacy and that becomes even further complicated after she meets Daniel because she realizes that her and Daniel's lives are so incredibly different and she doesn't know how Daniel is possibly going to fit into that. So she's having a lot of really complicated issues and feelings in her life. And you're really just watching the progression of their relationship as they are trying to overcome things. And I remember that Abby Jimenez just does emotion so phenomenally well in this book. There was a period of time when Alexis was not seeing Daniel. She refused to see him because of all of the things that were happening. And I just remember this deep ache in my chest. It felt like I had been broken up with. Like I was literally going through this breakup, not Alexis and Daniel. I could feel that depression and that despair. I could feel the connection and the chemistry between these two and how much they loved and cared for one another and how much it was killing them to be apart because of circumstances that really were kind of outside of their control. That is what really made this book a five-star romance read for me because it had absolutely everything that I wanted. It had really complicated, well-developed characters. It had fantastic chemistry. It was definitely more on the slow burn side. So they didn't just like rush into this relationship. They really got to know each other and things developed kind of naturally after that first one night stand. There was a natural level of angst and drama in here. I didn't really feel like it was overdone. I didn't feel like it was contrived. I didn't feel like Abby Jimenez was putting that conflict in here just to progress the plot of the story. It was extremely well paced. It was well developed. I love the characters in here so much. And this was just probably one of the best romances that I have ever read. I feel like this is a romance story that really everybody can get behind. And I've heard positive reviews about this, even from people who don't normally read romances. So this is certainly a well-deserved five-star read for the year so far. I loved it so much. I loved Alexis. I loved Daniel. I loved the life they built together and I cannot recommend this one enough. Question number two is the best sequel that I've read so far this year and that is hands down Dark Dawn by Jay Kristoff. This is one of the other five star reads that I've had so far this year. This is the third and final book in the Nevernight trilogy and when I tell you that this book made me sob, I am not exaggerating. The Nevernight Chronicles is easily one of my favorite series of all time. Jay Kristoff is a genius. He is a mastermind. His humor is phenomenal. I love his writing so much and I absolutely 
absolutely adored what he did with the ending of this series. I felt so incredibly satisfied by the end. If you're not familiar, The Nevernight Chronicles follows a badass female assassin by the name of Mia Corberry. When she was just 10 years old, she watched her father be hung for treason and her mother and baby brother were taken and assumed killed and she was taken and she was going to be killed as well, but she managed to escape. She wound up on the door of Mercurio and Mercurio used to be an acolyte of the Red Church, which is basically this place that trains assassins. And so Mercurio saw something in Mia, saw her need for vengeance, and he kind of took her under his wing and fueled those flames. And book one is all about her journey to the Red Church herself as she is training to become an acolyte of the Red Church and everything that goes down and then what happens afterwards. It is probably the best assassin series that I've ever read. So I just love this series with my whole heart and my whole soul. And this was certainly the best sequel that I have read so far in 2023. However, I do really just quickly want to give a shout out to House of Sky and Breath by Sarah J Mass. I recently just finished this a handful of days ago. I'm still kind of processing everything that happened. This certainly wasn't as strong in my opinion as House of Earth and Blood, but I still really enjoyed the reading process. I buddy read this with Sarah from Sarah's Nightstand and it was quite a journey. There was a lot that happened in here, a lot that was revealed and that ending. If you know, you know. That ending really just took this in a different direction that I was not expecting. I'm still not entirely sure how I feel about it. Like I said, I'm still processing everything that happened in this story, but I just love Sarah J Mass so much. I love the worlds that she create and the characters. This is her first ever adult fantasy series and she did a fantastic job in my opinion and so I couldn't not mention it here in this video. So this is another solid sequel that I've read so far. Question number three is a new release that you haven't read yet but want to and if I have to pick one I'm definitely going to say The Only One Left by Riley Sager and I actually just purchased that from Book of the Month so that will be coming to me in my July box. So as soon as I can get to it I'm absolutely going to. The Only One Left sounds absolutely phenomenal. It sounds like it might be a little bit of a take on the Lizzie Borden murders that happened and I am here for it. I'm very very excited to get to that one and I will be getting to it as soon as I can. Question number four is my most anticipated release for the second half of the year. I'm gonna be honest and I haven't looked too heavily into the releases that are coming out in the second half of 2023. I typically do releases on a month-to-month -month basis but one of them is definitely Midnight is the Darkest Hour by Ashley Winstead. I know that this is a very popular answer to this question and I can understand why but I will say that I'm only tentatively anticipating this release. I very much loved In My Dreams I Hold a Knife by her but I was underwhelmed by The Last Housewife. I had a lot of issues with it. It didn't hit me like I wanted it to. It was a little bit weird. I couldn't really get behind the sex cult aspect of it and some of their beliefs. It just was a little bit too over the top for my taste so it didn't quite work for me. I also felt a lot of pressure to really love the story and I think that kind of got to me mentally. So I'm tentatively anticipating this one. I really do want it to blow me out of the water. I really do want Ashley Winstead to be a reliable thriller suspense author for me especially because I know that she's not afraid to go to dark places and that's what I absolutely love in thriller suspense novels. So we're gonna see. I would say that that is definitely an anticipated release for me. Will I get to it by the end of the year? I don't know but it is one that is coming out in the second half of 2023 that I'm looking forward to. Okay question number five is my biggest disappointment so far in 2023 and I typically have a hard time answering this question because I don't necessarily go into a book thinking that I'm going to love it and I certainly don't think I'm going to hate it. I kind of go in hoping that I'm really going to enjoy it and then whatever it is it is. So I typically don't go into books with super high expectations but there is one book in particular I went in with extremely high expectations. I literally just finished this book not an hour ago and so I probably shouldn't even mention it here because I still haven't had a lot of time to really sit with my feelings and think about it and I'm still not entirely sure I understand what I read but I think I'm gonna go ahead and answer The Last Word by Taylor Adams and you don't even know how much it kills me to have this be my answer. Y'all know how I feel about No Exit. It is one of my favorite suspense thrillers of all time. The atmosphere in that, the intensity was so immaculate. I still think of that book constantly because of how much I loved it so much. I also read Hairpin Bridge by him which I didn't enjoy nearly as much as No Exit but I still enjoyed it. It was a little bit more on the unusual side in certain aspects but I still had an enjoyable reading experience. So I was very confident that I was going to love this because of the premise of the story. And the sad thing is is that I can't even really tell you what was a disappointment about this because it would be spoilers. Now I'm gonna say that I'm probably gonna rate this book four stars. So it wasn't even a terrible book overall. It was just so extremely different from what I was expecting it to be and he took it into directions that I didn't necessarily enjoy all that much and so it really kind of put me off giving this book a higher rating but I still think it was well written. I still think that there were some clever plot devices used in this story. I especially liked the awareness that Taylor Adams had in the story about authors and some of the tropes that authors put in their books. Like he kind of made fun of himself in this book which was a little bit interesting as well but there were just some aspects to this that I was really confused by. This follows our main character Emma Carpenter and she is currently living in isolation with her dog out on an island in the Pacific Northwest. She's house-sitting for a woman out there and she doesn't really want to be in contact with anybody. She is 
out there kind of running away from something tragic that happened in her recent past and she just wants to be out there alone with her dog reading books. The only person that she has any contact with is her neighbor Deke who lives about a quarter of a mile away and they really only have contact via whiteboards. Like they both have telescopes, they will both write a message on the board, look through the telescope and then respond and that's basically all they do. They don't have any contact in person. And so Emma is spending her days just kind of on the couch reading books on her Kindle. That's basically what she's doing all day until one day she reads this atrocious horror novel that she cannot stand. She goes on Amazon, she gives it a scathing one star review and she's actually contacted by the author asking her to take down her review. Of course Emma refuses. It gets into this really crazy back and forth between the two. She thinks nothing more of it. She thinks it's done but then some really sinister things start to happen around the property and she starts to suspect that it is actually the author of the horror novel and it kind of goes from there. And like I said I can't really tell you what was disappointing about this story without going into spoilers but you know just based on the back of the cover that it has to be a little bit more than that right? There has to be a little bit more to the story than this author just randomly deciding to seek vengeance for this one star review and there is but there also isn't and I don't really want to say anything more than that. I know that is extremely vague but I don't want to risk spoilers. I will be doing a full review of this on my channel and I think I will go into spoilers at that time because I really want to articulate what I liked and what I didn't like about this story and kind of what put me off giving this a higher rating. But even though I'm giving this like a 3.5 4 stars so it wasn't an awful read at all it definitely did not meet the high expectations that I had for it. So I feel confident in saying right now that because of those high expectations this is going to be one of my most disappointing reads of the year sadly. Question number six is my biggest surprise and my biggest surprise is actually one of the other five star reads for the year Way of Kings by Brandon Sanderson. Brandon Sanderson is definitely a well-known well-loved well-praised epic fantasy author in the bookish community and I have read the first two books in the Mistborn trilogy and to be honest I didn't love them. I still don't love them. I still don't even know if I want to continue the trilogy but I, I probably will especially after my experience with this but I wasn't on the Brandon Sanderson bandwagon and the reason I ended up picking this one up even though I still needed to finish the Mistborn trilogy is because one of the prompts for Slayer Fest was to read the longest book on my TBR and this certainly was that. At a thousand and seven pages this is easily the longest book on my TBR. What I ended up doing was I got the audiobook and I listened to it while reading physically and I think it made all the difference in the world. This book took me about two months to read. It definitely took me quite a long time but I was not in any hurry. I was just taking my time with it, reading it little by little, annotating it, highlighting it, doing what I needed to do. Overall this was just an experience. It was a journey and because I took my time and really immersed myself in the world in these characters I ended up being extremely sad when it was over. I felt like I was leaving behind friends and I absolutely cannot wait to get to the next book in this series. So this was by far a surprise for me because I was not expecting to love it as much as I did given my feelings on the Mistborn trilogy and those books are far smaller than this and this isn't even the biggest book. Every single other book that has been released in this series so far is bigger than this one. So you're talking extremely slow burn, sometimes tedious, world building, character development and everything like that. So I was very worried that this was going to be an extremely slow slog but it wasn't. I enjoyed myself far more in the story than I was ever expecting to and like I said now I can't wait. So this was certainly one of my biggest surprises in 2023. Alright so I'm actually going to kind of combine question number seven and number eight because they are going to go together. So question number seven is my favorite new author and for that I absolutely have to answer Abby Jimenez and the reason I say that is because I can now officially confirm her as an autobi author for me. I mean just reading part of your world alone was going to make her an autobi author for me but I actually just recently finished Yours Truly which is kind of the companion novel to part of your world. It follows Brianna Ortiz who is Alexis's best friend from the first book so this is her love story. I recently just finished it and really enjoyed it as well. It wasn't quite as strong for me as part of your world but it was still such a solid love story and it was better than many other love stories that I've read. Like I said I need very particular things in my romances and Abby Jimenez just does it so well and so now that I've read two books by her and I've loved both of them I can solidly put her as a new favorite author. And the reason why I want to also combine question number eight is because question number eight is my newest fictional crush and absolutely Jacob Maddox from Yours Truly and Daniel Grant from Part of Your World are my two newest fictional crushes. I don't get fictional crushes in books very often but these two male main characters are so swoon worthy. I don't know what it is but Abby Jimenez just knows how to write like the ideal male love interest. They're just this perfect combination of a cinnamon roll type character but also yet they have typical male characteristics that also that you want to see in this book. They're definitely not alpha male. They don't really have that toxic masculinity that you hear so much about. They're on the softer side but they are still very strong intelligent independent people and I just really love the way that Abby Jimenez is able to write male love interests. So Jacob and Daniel are for sure some of my newest fictional crushes and I cannot wait to see some of the other love interests that Abby Jimenez creates in her future stories. Question number nine is my newest favorite character and I think for this one I have to say Murderbot in Skyward from Brandon Sanderson. This is a young adult sci-fi series from Brandon Sanderson and Murderbot is actually an AI that is in a fighter ship that Spencer the main character discovers and she 
she kind of brings back to life and Murderbot is the AI intelligence that is in it. I can't even describe his personality because he's so funny, he's so hilarious, but he doesn't mean to be. Everything he says, he's saying with such sincerity and he claims that he doesn't have emotions, but yet he'll say things like about how hurt or offended he is by something that Spencer has said. And he was just such an amazing piece of comic relief in this story. And I cannot wait to see him in the rest of the series and see what Brandon Sanderson does with him because he was just such an amazing character in this. Question number 10 is a book that made you cry, Dark Dawn by Jay Kristoff. I am sure that there were a couple of other books this year that made me cry, but none of them would have made me come even close to crying as hard as I did in Dark Dawn. So I had to have this as the answer to this question. I was just full on sobbing by the end of this book. This gave me a legitimate book hangover to the point where I was just emotionally exhausted by the end of this. So for a book that made me cry, this one absolutely. And when I was opening it, I actually just found this letter from Jay Kristoff because this is the Illumicrate special edition. Let me read this to you. It says, hello, Illumicrators. Welcome to Dark Dawn. I apologize in advance. Please understand I did it all out of love and you can't say I didn't warn you. Thanks for the support and all the love you've shown the series and my stabby bitch daughter. I hope you agree she got the ending she deserved. So I think just that brief little note tells you right there that this book is going to absolutely break your heart and it did. It broke my heart but it put it back together again. So I'm gonna praise this book until the absolute end of time but it certainly had me sobbing near the end of it. Sorry if the angle's a little bit different. I had to clear some things from my memory on my phone. Question number 11 is a book that made you happy. So I'm gonna be honest and say that I don't read a lot of happy books. That's just not what I typically gravitate towards. Even in romance novels like those by Abby Jimenez and things like that, I still need that gut punch and that harder hitting element so it's emotionally devastating. But I do have two books here that I want to talk to you about and they made me happy for different reasons. The first is The Sweet Spot by Amy Popel. And this could actually serve as another one of the biggest surprises of the year because this was one of the very first books that I got from Aardvark, which I no longer have a subscription to. But I selected this just because it was my very first month with Aardvark. I needed to select something because I had a video that I was going to film comparing Aardvark to Book of the Month. And this was the only book that even came remotely close to something that I would gravitate towards on my own. And I had really no expectations for this whatsoever. I didn't think I was going to love it and I didn't necessarily think that I was going to hate it, but I didn't think I was going to enjoy it nearly as much as I did. This is essentially a comedy of errors. It follows three women who end up all being connected because of the actions of one other woman and all of the things that they have to go through because of this woman. And I just enjoyed this immensely. This is one of those books that is full of insanely quirky characters that you just can't help but fall in love with. And I loved the way that Amy Popel brought them all together and just developed these amazing relationships between all of the women and the people in their lives. So this made me happy because I was smiling throughout this book. There was a lot of great humor and sweet moments. And this made me happy because I was just smiling throughout this book. Like I said, there were a ton of quirky characters in here and they just made me laugh with some of the things that they did and they said. I highly recommend listening to this on audiobook if you have the opportunity, but this is certainly one that I would recommend if you want something to put a smile on your face because this will definitely do it. I also want to talk about Grady Hendrix, especially the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires. Grady Hendrix could also be up there as one of my new favorite authors for the year. I did read The Final Girl Support Group, I believe last year, but it was really the Southern Book Club's Guide to Slaying Vampires that really cemented Grady Hendrix as a favorite author for me. I just absolutely loved this and it was so different than what I was expecting and it took me on this journey. This was literally exactly what it sounds. It was about a group of women who are part of a book club and end up slaying a vampire in their neighborhood. But it was so much more than that. I've mentioned this multiple times before, but Grady Hendrix just has this phenomenally magical way of creating this book, which is horror. It obviously has some very dark and disturbing scenes, some gruesome body horror that's going on in here and taking this horrific book, but putting these really light comedic moments in here, but also some even serious darker moments with the characters themselves. So like some of the characters are going through some really rough things in here and he just combines all of this so fantastically. And I love the way that he's able to do this. So he creates these very character driven horror novels that can get a little bit weird. I'm going to be honest with you, especially with how to sell a haunted house and those puppets. Ooh, that got a little bit weird there for me, but I just love this one so much. And you know what? This is also kind of like an ode to women and their never ending responsibilities. That is really what this is, that women can do it all, especially slave vampires. So these were a bunch of badass book club, stay at home wives and mothers, and they just kicked ass in this story. And this really did make me happy. I did not expect to love this as much as I did. I gave it a 4.5 stars. I could not stop thinking about it once I was done reading it. And this certainly made me happy for sure. Question number 12 is my favorite book to film adaptation that I've watched so far this year. And I honestly don't know if I've watched more than one. I watched The Martian recently with my husband. We watched it over Memorial Day weekend when we were having like a movie day because we had a three day weekend. I had just recently finished The Martian. So it was very clear in my head. And so we ended up watching it because I was kind of in the mood to continue with it. I will say that I don't think the movie did the book justice and I wasn't even necessarily in love with the book. It was a solid four stars for me, but there were definitely a lot of complaints that I had about the book, but I still think that the movie didn't do nearly as well as it could have in portraying everything that Mark Watney went through to survive on Mars. All that to say, I think that is literally the only 
only book to film adaptation that I have watched and I didn't even love the film adaptation all that much. So it is what it is. Question number 13 is a favorite video that I've made in 2023 and I didn't go back and look at all the videos that I filmed but the two that really stick out are my Slayer Fest reading announcement that I did in March announcing my month-long or quarter-long Buffy themed readathon. I was really proud of just the readathon in general not maybe not necessarily the video but I was proud of the readathon in general but I'm also pretty proud of the video that I made recommending thrillers for beginners. I think I gave a lot of really fantastic recommendations for those who might be new to the thriller suspense genre and who are looking to dip their toes into it without getting into something that's incredibly dark and gritty and gruesome. So I was really proud of all of the recommendations that I put in that video and I will try to remember to link it down below for you. Question number 14 is the most beautiful book that I've bought or received in 2023 and y'all know what I'm gonna say. The fairy loot editions of House of Earth and Blood and House of Sky and Breath. I'm still obsessed with these editions y'all. They are just stunning and so sophisticated. There is something so classy about these in my opinion. I just cannot even handle it. Look at those frayed edges. The end pages of course are gorgeous and then the naked hardcover. I mean can you even? I did a full video unboxing these so I'll try to remember to link that down below for you as well if you are interested in seeing them a little bit more in depth but these are certainly the most beautiful books that I've bought so far. I also want to give a quick shout out to the fairy loot editions of The Adventures of Amina al Sarafi by Shannon Shopper Bordy because this is the first book that I received as part of the adult fairy loot book only subscription box. This was not a book that was on my radar until I got it in the mail and I saw their edition of it and now I'm super hyped to read it. It is a pirate fantasy which just adds the interest factor but I mean just okay first check out this cover. Look at those sprayed edges y'all. Here's the back. Here is the naked hardcover but what really got me about this book. Look at this map y'all. Not only is it full color but it's also foiled. I just saw this and I was like oh yeah I'm reading this book for sure because you cannot waste a map like this. So this is definitely another high contender for one of the most beautiful books that I bought so far this year. And then of course question number 15 is what books do I need to read by the end of this year? And there are quite a lot that I still need to read by the end of this year. Y'all know that I'm participating in quite a few reading challenges and so there are still a lot of books that I have not read to satisfy those reading challenges. I'm also desperately trying to finish series. So basically any sequel to a series that I'm in the progress of reading needs to be read. Although I know I don't realistically expect to finish all of those by the end of 2023, but those are definitely a priority. I still have a handful of books that I need to read as part of my 23 and 23 reading list. And of course, I'm still trying to read all of the books that come into me that I purchased from like book of the month or that have been sent to me or things like that. I'm trying to read those as they come in. I don't want them lingering on my shelves. Primarily focusing on all of the reading challenges that I'm trying to finish by the end of the year. I don't know how successful I'm going to be but those are top priority books as well as all of the books that I'm bringing into my home whether they are through bookish subscriptions or whether I'm physically going out and purchasing those books those are all priority because I don't want them lingering on my shelves. I'm trying to have a more effective in out system. I don't want to have an overflow of unread books on my shelves because I know what's going to happen. They're going to sit there for a long time and I'm just going to lose interest with them and that's what I do not want to happen. So so long answer to a short question those are all the books that I need to read by the end of the year. I know I didn't name any specifically but just know it's a lot of them. All right y'all that is it. That is the mid-year book freakout tag for 2023. Please comment down below and let me know what your favorite book of the year so far has been or please let me know what your biggest disappointment has been. I would be very interested to know and as always if you like this video or if you just like me please be sure to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe if you haven't already. I aim to post one video a week sometimes two depending on what I can do and I would sure love to see you in one of those next videos. Bye guys.